friends, this is Reverend David from Christian Path Ministries of Pennsylvania. Welcome to the Christian Path. I hope you're well today, and that today's message, Immorality, will enlighten us somehow as to the more distinctive features, for lack of a better word, of what immorality is and how to avoid it to better follow in the Lord's footsteps. As you know, the theme of this ministry is acknowledging the Holy Bible as the one and only how-to manual for being human. Now, if you've never heard that really used before as far as a comparison, think about it. The Bible is the original user's manual for being human. We, ex we, we study the experiences of people in the Bible, then relate them to our own lives, to become better Christians, to walk in the footsteps of Lord Jesus, so we can be more like our Lord and Savior, to get into God's kingdom. Did you ever hear the words immoral or immorality? I'm sure you have. We all have heard the words. But what exactly does that mean? We always think of sexual things, of immoralities, and that's true. That's a big part of it. But we're going to cover today how it goes beyond this physical, sexual aspects, how immorality opens doors that lead us to the wrong side of the road and lead us into Satan's realm, and how we can avoid that door, how we can keep it closed and stay on the path of the Lord. Now, according to the thesaurus, immoral, immorality means sinful, corrupt, shameless, depraved. Now, if we look up depravity, it says perverted, to debase. Now, we could look up every single word of every single definition. It kind of goes like a pyramid type of thing. And I guarantee that they will all stem back to immorality. And none of the definitions that we get will be good. Now, if you ask most people if they're immoral, come on, what do you think they're going to say? Some of the answers you'd probably get well, would be, well, I know I'm not perfect, but no, no, I, I wouldn't say that I'm immoral. Well, how many people do you know offhand that would proudly say, yes, I'm immoral and I'm proud of it. Thank you for asking. That's not going to happen. Let's face it, people will not admit that. Remember, the first definition of immoral is sinful. And how many people do we know that are completely, quote, sinless? Not many. Not even ourselves, in fact. None of us are completely sinless. And you know what? As long as we're human, we can't be. You've heard the expression, to, to err is human. Well, guess what? We can go a step further and say, to sin is human. As long as we're human beings in physical bodies, we will never be sinless. We can't be. And the Lord Jesus and God the Father know this. The only human that was actually sinless was Jesus himself. That was one of the reasons that he came here in human form. To show us, to be an example. That as humans, he knows we can't be sinless. But we need to follow his example. So that we can at least be close to it. Or as close to sinless as we possibly could be by following him. Although we're going to trip, we're going to fall, we're human, we're frail, the Lord knows this, but we needed a sample. 
We needed the Lord's example, so at least we know what direction to go in. And there are times when we sin without even realizing it. But when we step into immorality, the sin goes a little bit further. It goes one step beyond. When a person's doing something immoral, most times, if not all times, that person knows that what he's doing is wrong. And like we said, a lot of people automatically associate immorality with inappropriate sexual behavior or basically crossing the line for some reason. And in many cases, like we said, this is true. But we also see so many times in scriptures how immorality is warned against and how it's looked down on. We're going to discuss how immorality itself not only touches on inappropriate and perverted sexual behavior that's sinful, but how it overflows into a spiritual sin too. For example, when you get a chance, have a look at Proverbs 5 verses 1 through 9, where Solomon says, My son, pay attention to my wisdom, lend your ear to my understanding, that you may preserve discretion and your lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of an immoral woman drip honey and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is as bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps lay hold of hell. Lest you ponder her path of life, her ways are unstable. You do not know them. Therefore, hear me now, my children, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Remove your way far from her, and do not go near the door of her house lest you give your honor to others and your years to the cruel one. Now, what exactly is Solomon saying here? He's saying that a temptress, basically a harlot, is very sexy, attractive, appealing. You're going to be attracted to her. She'll tempt you with her lips, her sensuality. She'll lure you into doing something that you know that you shouldn't be doing. But the end results will be catastrophic. For a short while of immediate gratification, you don't know her ways or what her ulterior motives could be. You don't know what she's got in her mind. He's saying that her ways are unstable and her feet go down to death. Her steps go down to hell. He says, lest you give your years to the cruel one. Now, who is do you think he's talking about when he says the cruel one? We know he's talking about Satan himself. And basically... Solomon is saying, don't let your hormones rule your head. We know that sex drive is a very powerful thing. It's probably the second strongest to survival itself. But the end result could result in destruction, and probably will, if we engage in immoral behavior. Now, in verse 15, he says, drink water from your own cistern and running water from your own well. Now, what does that mean? Drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. Solomon is saying that being intimate with your own wife is the way you're supposed to go, or your own husband, not someone else's. Otherwise, it is immorality, and the consequences could be more severe than we could ever imagine. So we see here how Solomon, in all his wisdom, because remember, he was very, very profound in wisdom at the time. He had the wisdom that the Lord gave him, and he warns us of how immoral behavior can destroy our lives, lead us to the road that leads us right to hell. It can lead to death. And he tells us what can happen if we practice immorality. Now think about this. Do you think that sexual immorality happened in biblical times? Well, sure did. There are so many cases of it in scriptures. And we're just going to go through a few of them here. Because if we go through all of them, we're going to be here until a week from next Friday. So we're just going to mention a couple. Now, remember after the flood, when Noah became drunk and he was uncovered in his tent, in Genesis 9, 21 through 27, when he awoke, he knew what his grandson Canaan had done to him. He actually cursed him then. Now the scriptures don't tell us explicitly exactly what Canaan did, 
but we can pretty much surmise what happened, and it was a perverted, immoral act. Because we know that Noah, it says earlier in the scripture, that he was uncovered and drunk, so we know what happened, and why he woke up, and why he would have been so angry, and he cursed Canaan to be a servant, he and all of his heritage behind him. Now what about Samuel? 2 Samuel, chapter 13, verses 1 through 21, where David's son, Amnon, was in love with his sister Tamar. Now, do you remember that one? Again, take a look at that. It's 2 Samuel 13, 1 through 21. Tamar was a virgin, and Amnon loved her. He desired her so much that he became physically sick over it. He was infatuated. He was in love with. He was desiring, with a very strong sexual desire, his own sister. And he knew that it was inappropriate for him to do anything to her. It wasn't proper. So he just let it eat at him, and he became physically ill. So his friend Jonadab, who was also his cousin, was a pretty slick guy, and he came up with a plan. He told Amnon, he says, why are you not eating? Why are you laying there? Why are you sick? And Amnon told him, because he wanted his sister Tamar, he was in love with her, he, he desired her. Well, what did Jonadab come up with? He said, well, you know what to do? Pretend you're sick so that your father, King David, will come to visit you. When he does, tell him that you're ill and that you want your sister... Tamar to come to your house here and cook a meal for you. So he did that. And David came, King David came to his son's house, came to Amnon's house, because he thought he was sick. And of course, Amnon was faking the whole thing to be a lot sicker than he was. And he told King David that he wanted his sister Tamar to come there and prepare cakes for him and feed him. And King David agreed. He didn't think anything of it. So Tamar arrives, Amnon had her brought to his bedroom to cook for him, sent everybody else out of the room, but then guess what happened? When she brought the food over to him, when he was laying in his bed, he didn't want the food, he just grabbed a hold of her, and he said, lie with me, my sister. Well, Tamar was kind of shocked, and she said, no, no, don't do this evil, immoral thing. Ask King David, ask the king, ask our father to give me to you. He will do that. But you know what? Amnon didn't want to hear it. He just grabbed his sister, pulled her down on the bed, and he raped her. Then, when he was done, he hated her more than he loved her initially and had her thrown out of the house in complete shame. So, what do you think? Was this an immoral act? <laughs> no, if this isn't immoral, nothing is. So she cried bitterly all the way home. And when she got there, and King David had heard about what happened, he was furious. But he was not as mad as his other son, Absalom. Or Absalom. Now, Absalom hated Amnon for what he did to their sister Tamar. But for two full years, he pretty much kept a level head about it. He didn't do anything. He didn't say anything. But then what happened? After the two years were up, he organized an outing of sheep shearers that included Amnon. And in verse 28, we see what Absalom did, where he says to his servants, Watch now, when Amnon's heart is murray with wine, and when I say to you, strike Amnon, then kill him. Do not be afraid. Have I not commanded you? Be courageous and valiant. So the servants did as Absalom commanded. They killed Amnon. So we see here that what happened to Amnon for his immorality. It, sure, it took two years, but think about it. The whole two years, Absalom was angry. He hated his brother. He hated Amnon for what he did to their sister, and he was just waiting for the right opportunity to kill him. But of course, the whole two years, he didn't let on. So King David let him go on the sheep shearing trek with everyone, not knowing that he was going to be killed for what he did. So we see it came back to bite him. We can see what immorality did. Now, let's remember the case of David and Bathsheba. Remember that in 2 Samuel chapter 11, where King David got up out of his bed and he went out onto his roof. 
He looked across. He saw Bathsheba taking a bath. She was a beautiful girl. He knew she was someone else's wife, but he slept with her anyway. He had her brought to him. He wound up getting her pregnant. Then he had to cover his tracks because her husband was in the army that David was the leader of because David was the king. Bathsheba was married to Uriah the Hittite. And David tried to come up with this whole exotic plan to make it look like she was pregnant with her husband's child, not his, but it backfired. So what did he do? He had Uriah killed in the war purposely. And then he married Bathsheba. But was this an immoral act? <laughs> you bet it was. And the Lord did not like it one bit. He said to David, you know, if I have given you, I've delivered you out of Saul hands. I've given you this. I've given you the kingdom. I've given you reign over all of Israel. And if that wasn't enough, I would have given you much more. And you turn around and did this? David was not in good graces with the Lord, and he was punished. So what happened to him? What punishment did he get? The child that was born, his child from Bathsheba, died when he was very young. Now, what about Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19, verses 1 through 28? They were so corrupt and immoral that the Lord actually sent two angels to destroy them. To destroy the entire cities. So this tells us how immoral and corrupt and perverse Sodom and Gomorrah were. So we see in biblical times, people did immoral things. And you'll notice that every one of them had consequences. And none of the consequences were good. What about today, in the 21st century? Do people still do immoral things <laughs> I think we can answer that in two seconds. Just watch the news. Look on the internet. Take a look around. Look at what people are doing. Look at what's going on all over the place. All kinds of immorality. Did you notice that immorality itself is compared to sexuality and perverted acts? And that's all in the physical sense. But what about in the spiritual sense? You'll notice that several times in the Bible... The Lord mentions immorality related to harlotry, which, of course, we know is basically playing the physical sense as far as being a prostitute or a harlot, playing the harlot. But this does go beyond physical. When the Lord says that his people were, quote, playing the harlot, what did he mean? Well, sure, I, I, I can imagine that they were doing sexual perversions and things that they shouldn't have been doing in a physical sense but he the Lord is talking about something that goes deeper on a spiritual sense when he was saying his people are quote playing the harlot and if we remember too several times in the scriptures you'll notice the Lord angers very quickly at idolatry this gives us the answer to what the Lord was saying we know that the Lord is a jealous God he tells us that and to him his people playing the harlot go beyond sexual, physical things. It means worshipping false gods, false idols, playing the harlot, submitting themselves to these false gods that don't even exist. When he is their father, he is their god. Remember a few of the definitions he, that we had for immorality? Shameless, corrupt, depraved, pretty much lowering yourself so that you're nothing more than a cheap harlot? If we worship any false god instead of our Father and our Savior, Lord Jesus, we're doing just that. We're playing the cheap harlot. I've had people say to me, I don't worship false gods. Meaning, meaning of course, that they don't physically get on their knees, bow down, pray to a statue of Thor, Apollo, or Baal, or any actual stone or wooden figure. But think about this. Anything that we put above the Lord, and I mean anything, whether it's a house, a car, a job, money, even other people, like celebrities. Did you ever see people that literally adore these celebrities, these singers, these pop artists? They think that they're above humanity. Especially this problem, it really tends to run with 
young people, like teenagers, teeny boppers, stuff like that, they look at these teen stars, these young pop idols, and they are so intrigued. They all but get down and pray to them. They are looking up to these people like they are gods and goddesses. We're not physically worshipping them in the physical conventional sense of the word, but we put them above the Lord in all other things. Think about it. If you're worshipping a false idol, a statue of something, or a person is intrigued and fascinated and obsessed with a celebrity, or they're obsessed with their money, their job, their house, even their family, their car, anything. I mean, anything that we put above the Lord is committing harlotry, if we're putting it above Him, because although we don't think we're worshipping this thing, it is a false idol, it, it is idolatry, and it is playing the harlot, and as far as the Lord's concerned, committing an immoral act. So what we're saying here, basically, is that immorality isn't just limited to physical sexual perversions, adulteries, fornications. It also reaches into our spiritual lives in the form of idolatry, putting anything on this earth above the Lord, and I mean anything or anyone. And to do it is, in effect, immorality. And we've seen from the examples that we covered that the Lord hates harlotry. He hates idolatry and immorality in the physical and the spiritual sense. So what do we do? As Christians, think about this. We're in the physical world. We're in the world. Not necessarily of it. But how can we shun sin? How can we completely avoid immorality? How can we stay on the Christian path, stay in the Lord's footsteps, put the Lord first, put the kingdom first, and keep our priority in our spiritual realm that's coming, the kingdom of God, not all the, quote, garbage that's on this earth, things that are going to pass away. Because when we physically pass away, this stuff stays here. It's just stuff. It's just junk. How do we do this? How do we overlook it? And it's not easy. You know that. When you're around other people, we have our physical desires. We have our human natures. We have other people trying to influence us. And of course, let's not forget our ultimate enemy, Satan himself and his demons and his legions that are constantly trying to pull us back to think as the world does. How do we do this? How do we shun all of this and continue on the Lord's path to get to the kingdom and please and serve our Father and our Savior? We have to stay in constant touch with the Lord by way of prayers. In other words, don't make a move. Don't even take your next breath without first inquiring of the Lord. And read the Bible every day. Remember, it's our how-to manual for being human to follow in the footsteps of Lord Jesus and stay on the Christian path. You know, back in biblical times, do you remember that the Lord used to send angels to people in dreams, in visions, sometimes physically, to tell them, okay, look, this is what the Lord said, this is what he wants you to do, this is what the score is. And it was, it was easy to do because these people were being told flat out, this is what the Lord says. Now, these days, it doesn't happen quite that often. Angels very rarely appear to us unless it's absolutely crucial. Why? Because we have the Bible. We have the scriptures. Remember the scriptures, the New Testament did not exist back in ancient biblical times. It wasn't even written until after the Lord was here. So the only way he could get messages across were to physically send messengers but we have the Bible. That's why I can't emphasize enough how important the Bible is. We know that walking on the Christian path, staying in the Lord's footsteps is not an easy to th thing to do. Because we live in a corrupt, immoral world. But don't forget too, even though it's a very hard path that we're on, you're not on the Christian path alone. The Lord wouldn't put you on this path. He wouldn't call you to do this and then completely abandon you there. 
We have the Lord himself. We have the Holy Spirit, which is the Lord's power that he promised us when we repent and were baptized. And I don't mean baptized into any specific denomination or religion, just baptized in the name of Lord Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit then. We have the Bible, of course, and we have each other. We're not alone on this path, brethren. We have each other. We have all these things. We're far from alone. Now, if you need to reach me for any reason, all my contact information is right on my website. It's www.mychristianpath.net, www.mychristianpath.net. So if you need to contact me, don't hesitate. And also, you can hear this message and all the other messages I've done so far right on the site. You can either download them, listen to them from the site, or if you would like a copy of a CD or DVD, just let me know. I'd be happy to send you one absolutely free of charge. So, as we walk on the Christian path, remember to follow in the footsteps of Lord Jesus. We have to keep our mind focused on God's kingdom. The immoralities are here. They always were since the very beginning of humanity until the Lord comes back and we have the millennium. Immorality was here, it is here, and it will be here. We know this. We as Christians have to look beyond it. Remember, think on a spiritual level. Think as a spirit, not as a human. Because basically we are not humans, we're spirits encased in in a human body until the time comes when we're released from our bodies to join the Lord in the kingdom. So keep your mind focused on the kingdom. Shine a light to others. Keep your prayer lines open. Keep your Bible glued to your side. Remember to read scriptures every day because this is our how-to manual for being human. The Bible. It's very important. And the Lord guides us to certain parts of the Bible to teach us, to show us, and to tell us certain things that he wants us to know. Keep your faith strong. We can grow in the Lord's wisdom and keep our Christian morals in a corrupt and immoral world, and one day we will get into the Lord's kingdom. Until next time, this is Reverend David. Thank you for joining me for the Christian Path. Goodbye, friends.